Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy, and today I want to do a quick follow-up on my $1,000 bet with Flat Earther Jack. Now, just to bring you up to speed, on about October 20th of this year, I was in a Flat Earth Live with one Jack Thrax. Now, Jack, who also goes by the name of Dan Mercer, was talking about his favorite Flat Earth proof, and that is that Larry Bingsinger, who was an amateur radio operator in Louisville, Kentucky, was able to receive radio transmissions from the surface of the moon on the inner suit radios of Aldrin and Armstrong. And he was actually able to intercept the voice of President Richard Nixon as he made his famous phone call to the moon. Well, according to Jack, the moon had already set in Louisville, Kentucky, so therefore they no longer had line of sight because the moon was below the horizon on a globe Earth. Therefore, if the Earth was a globe, they had to have faked the moon landing because it, the signal had to have originated from Earth, probably someplace close to Louisville, Kentucky. I have heard tell that in the past he has claimed that it came from a building at the Louisville airport, perhaps from the air guard base there in Louisville, but I didn't hear him actually say that to my ear. But the bottom line is he bet me and any other Glober $1,000 that we could not disprove that the moon had already set during the moon landing in Louisville, Kentucky. Challenge accepted, Jack, or Dan as the case may be. And I went ahead and I made two videos showing some of the evidence of why this was not the case. And I demonstrated that the moon, in fact, did not set until nine minutes after midnight on the morning of July 21st, and the moon landings occurred the evening before on July 20th, 1969. And I used data from Stellarium and other astronomical sources to demonstrate that. Let's see what kind of response we got from our flat earth friend, Jack. Well, let's not make fun of poor Jack for his lack of ability to spell and create grammatically correct sentences, but let's go try and get to the heart and the spirit of what he's telling me. It says, Bob, while your response is appreciated, what we have in reality is that it is 2025, not 1969, which you are basing your conclusions on. You see, Bob, we have achieved a multi-magnitude leap in the precision of our orbital models and the computational ability to apply them, making the predictions of 2025 much more reliable than those of the 1960s. He then goes on to give us some derp about the uh, crescent moon and the orbital speed of the moon, but then again restates his claim that the moon set at 9.54 p.m. in Louisville, Kentucky on July 20th, 1969. And while he acknowledges that the evidence I presented showed that the moon set at 12.09 a.m. on July 21st, he still doubles down and says that it set at 9.54 p.m. on the 20th and therefore it would have been below the horizon when Nixon had his famous phone call to the moon. Then he goes on to quote the article from the Louisville Courier Journal, which, well, it's Courier, not Carrier, but the Courier Journal, which was based on observations, apparently, and not orbital mechanics of the day. It is therefore my duty to inform you that you do not qualify for any $1,000 payment. Thank you for playing. So where do we stand with this? Well, first of all, he claims that my data from 2025 apparently was somehow different than the data uh, which was derived, according to him, from direct observation in 1969. Now, of course, Kepler and Gauss were the ones that developed orbital mechanics and the ability to predict the location of celestial bodies. And that was done in the, uh, in the 17th century. The 17th century is well before 1969. I may be old, but I'm not that old. Second of all, I really don't think he knows what time Nixon's phone call and the moonwalk were in Louisville, Kentucky, because he's quoted the wrong time several times. I don't think he realizes that there's a time zone issue. But the most important thing that I gained out of this entire paragraph is he acknowledged that there was a $1,000 bet. And his response, of course, was that I hadn't won it, but I can't win something that didn't exist in the first place. That'll be more interesting a little later. 
Now the very next uh, paragraph was one written by me, and that was where I introduced the poster as being the Jack that was the subject of the video. Uh, I did discuss the fact that he doubled down when he was confronted with this uh, material, and the bet is now $2,000. And I outlined his position that time and date, the Naval Observatory, Stellarium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, were just opinions on moonrise and moonset that day, and apparently, according to Jack, were equally valid with his opinion that the moon had set at 9.54 or something. Now, this is a very common characteristic of science denial as well. Uh, many times you'll hear the term used by science deniers of Occam's razor. Now, Occam's razor is seen a lot in science, and that is where you have two equally valid possibilities. The one that requires the fewest assumptions is probably the correct one. And flat earthers and other science deniers like to talk about Occam's razor when it comes to the flat earth, because as we look out, of course, the horizon looks relatively flat to us. And my cat thinks that the earth is flat based on his vantage point and his brain power. However, what they fail to understand is that in order to apply Occam's razor, you have to have two equally valid possibilities. The flat earth and the spherical earth are not equal in likelihood or possibility. Uh, the flat earth just simply is not a possibility, and we have just oodles of evidence for a spherical earth. They're not six of one and half a dozen of the other. There's one that's clearly right and one that is very clearly wrong. Now, when I responded to him in his initial post, uh, one of the things that I did point out for the audience was the irony of a flat earther using the setting of the moon and the range of handheld radios, because the moon is, you know, so far away, as evidence of the flat earth. That just baffles my mind. How would the moon possibly set on a flat earth? it would never go below the horizon. Yet his entire argument is based on the moon going below the horizon. Now here is where my subscribers stepped up. A number of them went out and started doing a little bit of research on their own, which actually is the kind of the goal of my channel. I like people to go on out and do stuff for themselves. You know, if they have a question, go look for an answer, learn how to do that. But let me show you one that particularly interested me. This is Tyson Dog, who went ahead and pulled the archives of the Louisville Courier Journal. And he actually looked at the times uh, that were published on the front page of that paper for when the moon rose and set. And as you can very clearly see, on the 17th of July in 1969, the moon set at 11.02 p.m. The 18th, 11.25, then 11.46, then it didn't set at all, as you can see, on the 20th, because it didn't set until after midnight on the 21st, 12.08 a.m consistent with what we're talking about. The moon sets approximately 12 hours after it rises, and on July 20th, according to the Louisville Courier Journal, it rose at 1221. Now, the other thing that you have to appreciate is how the moon actually appears in our sky. You know, as you know, the moon orbits around the Earth, which means that basically for any point on the Earth, you're going to see the moon for 12 hours of the day, and then it'll be on the other side of the Earth for the other 12 hours. So when the moon rises, it's going to set from wherever you are about 12 hours later. Now, there is some variation to that, of course, uh, and I'd be happy to explain that if anybody had any questions. Now, the other thing that's very important is that you can actually get the archives of the Louisville Courier Journal, and they're available on something called newspapers.com. And if you look at the July 20th issue of the Courier Journal, it says moonrise at approximately 12.21 p.m. And it does not list a moonset during the day of the 20th. And again, that's because the moon set at 12.08 a.m. on the 21st. But this is very easy to find for anybody that wants to look. Now, was Jack right in his reasoning? No, he wasn't. And this was pointed out by a number of my viewers, including this Jerry Walker. Uh, the idea that somehow orbital mechanics was significantly worse now than they were in 1969 is just ludicrous. Again, we've been using orbital mechanics since the uh, 1700s. Now, I don't really understand why he's using the development date of Stellarium in 2011 
as somehow making it archaic. I link Stellarium to my telescope and I use it to point my telescope to this day. And guess what? The things that I, I point to in Stellarium appear in the viewfinder of my telescope. It seems to work. Now, one of the characteristics of science denial is not lack of intelligence, despite our friend Jack here. Uh, it's in the inability to do deductive reasoning and connect the dots. Now, one of the things that he likes to talk about is that the article in the Courier-Journal discussing this radio interception said that they got the message from the moon about 10 seconds prior to hearing it on the television. I'm thinking that poor Jack has never heard of a broadcast delay and didn't take into account the fact that the phone call from Nixon had to be routed from Washington to Houston to the dish in Australia, transmitted to the moon, brought back from the moon, and by the way, that transit time is about 2.4 seconds then transmitted back to Houston and then back up to the White House. There's really very little wonder here that there was a couple of seconds difference between what they heard directly from the moon and on the TV. But I don't think he can make that connection. But let's look at Jack's argument as to why he wants to disregard the Naval Observatory and Stellarium data. Let's see what he has to say. Now, the thrust of Jack's argument here is that the time of 9.55, that would be actually 21.55, as reported in the Courier-Journal, suggests an observation-based time set rather than an orbital mechanics, which is why many tables use to give easy averages. the science of which is now much better and points to 955 rather than 1207 as more precise. And then he goes on with this nonsense about the phase of the moon. And then he just kind of insults me a little bit, which is pretty typical. And then he again confirms the bet. Therefore, my evidence stands as Bob has not qualified. And if he were to put up 1000 against my evidence in court of law, he might even lose it. Well, guess what, Jack? I didn't have to put up anything. Your bet was you would pay $1,000 to any glober that disproved your claim. I have done so. You, sir, owe me $1,000. And then you doubled down on it when I presented the evidence. So now you owe me $2,000. You want to do it again? And then he goes on to just re restate his derpity derp real quick. Uh, again, claiming that the moon set was at 9.55, and again, I guess he's referring to the, um, the PM. And then he sits down and tries to straw man us. Uh, he's, he's trying to get, say our argument now is that Basinger faked it with the dirty mason Rutherford. What is the deal with flat earthers and masons? Oh yeah, I remember. That comes from the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. The Masons are the ones that act for this nefarious group. Great to show your true colors there, Jack. I kind of like Tyson here because he just is pulling no, pro no punches with Jack. Uh, yes, you are pathetic, Jack. You owe me $1,000 and an apology. Actually, it's 2000 now. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. And then it just goes on to repeat the information from July of 1969 in Louisville. And again, on the 20th, moon rise, 12.20 p.m., moon set, 12.08 a.m. on the 21st. And again, if you look at the pattern here, you'll see that it's about 12 hours after uh, moon rise that you get moon set. So again, 12.20 p.m. to 12.08 a.m., pretty reasonable. Jack, just be a man. Uh, I've already told you once that if you admitted that you were wrong, that the Earth is indeed a sphere, and you made a video apologizing to me uh, concerning those facts, I would give up the claim on the $1,000. You refused me and doubled down to $2,000. So now it's $2,000 to you, my friend. Now, of course, Jack goes on to demonstrate he has no idea how these tables are created or how orbital mechanics work. He's desperately trying to find some different information. But we have the Louisville time, which is what, what's at stake here. Now, why is Jack 
putting out all this information. Well, apparently he has some sort of a hard on for the moon landing. Let's go see what he said. Nowhere did I say we can get to the moon. Your entire argument, in fact, is that the moon was below the horizon when Basinger got his radio messages. Now, I've already thoroughly debunked that, and you owe me $2,000, but that was your argument. Now, this is a very interesting claim, considering I'm studying astronomy right now, and uh, I have quite a, an observatory in my backyard. I don't know what he means by a certified astronomer. But I found this very interesting. Jack was having his butt handed to him, not just by me, but by a lot of other people. It's quite a long thread, and he was definitely getting the worst of it. So he desperately needed to try and find an ally somewhere because nobody was standing up for him. But that's okay. When in doubt, find a sock account. Dan Mercer and Jack Thrax are the same people. And this is the only one right here that uh, stood up for him, was his sock account. <laughs> so once again, I point out the fact that Jack, or Dan Mercer, made this bet. He doubled down on it, and I'm not going to let him go. Uh, the Flat Earthers love to talk about this Garcia case, which involved another internet bet. And again, I'm asking him to contact me with his contact information so we can go ahead and take this to the next step. A couple of years ago, we had the Garcia case down in Georgia, and Flat Earthers love to say that the globe was put on trial. Unfortunately, that case really didn't have too much to do with the globe, but it had a lot to do with an internet bet, very much like this one. The problem Garcia ran into was that there really wasn't clear evidence that a bet had occurred and that a certain standard had actually been met. I think we've done that here. But let's stick with the terms of service here, okay? I would never suggest that anybody go out and try and find Mr. Dan Mercer uh, and get his contact information. They certainly shouldn't send it to an email if they could possibly find an email on me. And there is no way that I would ever consider sending $50 by PayPal to the first person to give me actionable information to allow me to file suit against Mr. Mercer to collect this bet. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out anonymously from Northern Michigan. Take care, everyone.